Richard, when you think back to growing up in Crenshaw, California, what are some of the first memories that come to mind? <laughs> I was actually born in Watts, and uh, the only other Caucasian family on the block were, I, I hate to use the term hillbillies or whatever, and I'd get beaten up for killing Christ and I didn't even know who Christ was. Uh, <laughs> the African-American neighbors couldn't have been kinder though. And then we moved to Crenshaw where I, I went to middle school and high school. Uh, it was very interesting. So how was that for you to, to, did you not realize that it was sort of a fish out of water scenario and maybe that helped you just see people as people and not something where you, if you'd come from Beverly Hills and I hate to just throw that town as the... As it, it was, I, I grew up in the 50s and the 60s and we kind of moved every three years into a slightly better house. And so during my middle school period, we we're in this little area called Baldwin Hills, which was adjacent Crenshaw, but we went to school in Crenshaw. And it was white turning black. And the Gentile parents blamed it on the Jewish realtors and their kids took it out on me. So mm -hmm. I went through very virulent anti-Semitism. Uh, and it kind of came to a head, I was 13 years old, and my best friend with all the group around me challenged me to a fight and I couldn't hit him. And I stood there with my hands at my sides and started crying and now they're calling me a fag and a Jew. Mm. A year later I was six feet tall and fought my way into a gang. More West Side Story than Boys in the Hood, but I was very athletic. And then my first semester at high school, I was a, a state track champion. Uh, so I got along very, very well with the kids at Dorsey High School. Uh, and I wasn't lonely. I wasn't lonely, but I, I had a couple rough years. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I read voraciously. And uh, you know, then I, I got involved in the civil rights movement and then the anti-war movement and you know, just kind of grew out of that. But, but it was largely caused by that trauma of anti-Semitism. Uh, the, the, the black kids couldn't have treated me better as long as I was in my neighborhood. I, I was almost killed once in the next, what do you call, like a, uh, you know, turf zone. But uh, I, I couldn't have been treated better by the African-American people, you know, at, at Audubon Middle School and, and Dorsey High School. Sure. You know, and I, I'm still close with them today and I might be doing some projects, development with the community in Crenshaw coming up. So, and McCarthyism was going on at this time as well, or they were just coming out of it? You said it was the 50s? It was, my parents went through that. Uh, for me, I, I didn't notice the McCarthyisms. I, I, I'm sure the, the, the parents of the anti-Semitic kids who, who, who bullied me and tortured me were anti-communist or whatever as well, but it was more just uh, pure anti-Semitism. And, and then I hit the point, I, I was 14 years old, 15, now I'm very athletic, six feet tall, and then I was never bullied. Mm -hmm. the, the price was too high. Sure. Even if it was a bigger guy, the price was too high. Well, I always- I, I, I'm not violent, by the way. Oh, okay. I, I, yeah. I, although I, I boxed for 25 years. Well, yeah, that was actually, I was <laughs> leading to that and I wanted to but ask. It was, uh, in a nutshell, I look at life as theater. Uh, I don't like to hit people. I don't like to get hit. Uh, some people can put a basket through a hoop, hit a fastball, hit a tennis ball. And for some reason, I was just a natural tall middleweight with a knockout right hand which uh, someone from the next neighborhood in high school experienced once in front of my teammates, which gave me a little bit of a reputation when I dropped a big guy. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> uh, I liked being accepted into this other, call it like a Damon Runyon-esque universe with the old fighters and the young fighters. And you know, I was a part of this universe, so I was a, a sparring partner on and off in a pro stable until I was about 50 years old. Uh, but, you know, then I direct a play or direct a video. Uh, I'm writing food and wine reviews, which, <laughs> you know, a lot of calories, a lot of wine, and this would just keep me in ridiculous shape. 
Uh, what, what do you think having a tough beginning prepares you for? Because I've seen people take it both ways. I've seen some that self-destruct and others that are able to actually go and transcend further than people that had and a more idyllic, uh, you know, setting growing up in terms of whether they were bullied, whatever it was. What do you think it teaches people? Well, I, the other side of my growing up, I had a very stable home life. A amazing father, amazing mother, uh, very supportive. So I, I didn't have the adversity that other kids might be growing up with, with trouble in the house. Uh, my mother went on, po she was an English teacher, and then after age 50, published 16 novels, won two Emmys. Wow. So I, I had a, you know, an, a, a great younger brother. He never got in fights. I kept him out of some fights. Hmm. Uh, but uh, the only adversity was just that virulent anti-Semitism and the group of friends, you know, kind of over a two, three year period, having the people you were close to turn against you. Yeah. But, but I had that, you know, I'd come home to this wonderful home life with great support of parents. So I had that going at the same time. And I was a voracious reader, you know, so I had this other universe or universes that, that I was into. How do you think that toughened you up? Because right now we're, in, and forgive me for, for using the word snowflake, but we're in this new thing where people are very offended and I realize we're in some very divisive times, but how do you think that toughened you up? so that you weren't, I would imagine that if, if you've been bullied and you've had people that you, you knew turn against you, you have to do some pretty serious soul searching whether you realize it or not at that, that age. How do you think it toughened you up? Well, I, 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 Forbidden Zone was the absolute most politically incorrect film you could possibly do. I did this 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I had the most wonderful experience uh, in athletics at an African-American high school and, and like on the buses to track meets and games and stuff like that, people would joke about their differences and it was completely good natured. Right. And that's how I grew up and Forbidden Zone was kind of a human cartoon. Uh, I wouldn't do things I did 40 years ago in Forbidden Zone and I just wrote a big article about it in Dead Central. If anybody wants to look it up, okay, we can link uh, to it. I, I say there's like stream of consciousness. This was stream of diarrhea, <laughs> of just anything I could throw against okay. the wall. There was no censorship. Right. Uh, but I, I'm not. A, I, I am an entertainer at heart, and I do outrageous humor. And there's no way to be outrageous without somebody somewhere taking offense. Sure. And mm -hmm. I, I just don't worry about it. But in terms of people trying to take you down a few pegs. How do you think that toughened you up? Because obviously there are those that haven't experienced certain things and maybe they're more offended by things that aren't really that serious. It seems serious to them. But I would imagine that, especially too, if you're in a ring getting hit and it could be good natured, but it's within the realm of the fight. Well, I don't, uh, God, I'm trying to think. It's, uh, I, I was born with a natural right hand. <laughs> Okay, and then it, it was like not till my mid late twenties in the boxing ring that I had a knockout left hook. So I could be in the ring with somebody who's a much better boxer, but at least the first two, three, four rounds, I could knock them out if they made a mistake. By round five, just like a poker tournament where the pros get rid of the amateurs with little telegraphing things, that then a pro, even if I could hit harder than him, could figure me out and kick my butt. <laughs> Uh, I don't, I'm trying to think, how, how do I answer that? Uh, I, I don't worry about that. Uh, I, I, I know whatever, I, first of all, there's always been artistic censorship in different forms, from the left, from the right. You, you look at the, you know, the, the Maoist Red Guards breaking the hands of older pianists, you know, to get rid of the olds, and, and obviously censorship from the right you know, Spanish Inquisition, whatever. Uh, but I, I just don't worry about that, knowing that I'm just trying to entertain people, and no matter what I do, someone's going to be offended. I'm not sure if you use the term that you're an optimist, but you, you seem that you, you don't let things get you too down. And I, I feel like that's 
one of the keys to people remaining in this town because there's so many things that knock people down on a daily basis and it feels like the world's turning around oh the heavens are opening up and then bam there you go again that's just kind of what it is whatever you're pursuing here yeah, I, I'm an optimist, the cup half full. Uh, I, I feel very blessed. I've got a wonderful family. Uh, <coughs> my media company produced 275 videos. The company got hacked, crashed three years ago. Now I've got another film. Uh, I'm very happy with what I just did. Blessed with great producing partners, great cast, great crew. Then I'll be doing Forbidden Zone 2 right after that. Uh, so I, I feel very blessed. Okay, so when one of these things happens that seems earth shattering, do you see it as earth shattering or do you say, let me get a good night's sleep, let me have a great barbecue and a glass of wine and then tomorrow's a new day? Yeah, that, that's me. Okay. Uh, I, I, I love to cook for my cast and crews. Okay. So I do famous barbecues and I, I do theatrical parties. Ooh, okay. Uh, so there's always something. <laughs> Sure. And, and I just, uh, I, I thank God, for some reason, I just don't stay down. Uh, it, you know, shit happens. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, of course <laughs> shit happens. You know, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, I, I, I bounce back. You bounce back. Were yeah. you always like this? This, was, this has always been your, your makeup? I'm trying to think. Other than that rough period um, in middle school where I was just had so much, uh, you know, and then I cracked and kind of like, like went to the dark side. Oh, one thing it did teach me is I have more empathy for young kids that get into trouble, kind of understanding the reasons why. So, so I, I did come out a more empathetic character. It, you know, when I see teenagers get into trouble sure. for one reason or another, knowing that there's, there's reasons, there's reasons and that they're potentially good souls. Do you prefer making plans? for a project, or do you prefer to have plans made for you and then carry them out? Uh, I'm, I like making my own plans. Um, ironically, the film that I just directed, Hipsters, Gangsters, Aliens, and Geeks, is only really the second time since Forbidden Zone that I've directed my own material. The other stuff, I've been a hired gun, and it's exhilarating, and this is where I like to be. I plan my dinners, I plan my films. <laughs> oh, interesting. Okay, da so down to the course. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, you know, particularly when I'm cooking for a lot of people, I, I go through every step of what I'm going to do beforehand, just like a shot list for a film, mentally. It, you know, because you've got to be organized with all this stuff happening, and then something like a spice is missing, or the fire's too hot. Or a celiac shows up. Yeah, and yeah. And you don't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what yeah. do you do? <laughs> How do you improvise? You just roll with the punches. But I'll cook for up to 200 people, you know, with helpers. Oh, okay. With helpers. Okay. So do you almost see dinner as its own theater in some sense? The theatrics of, of getting everything ready and chopping it up? Yeah, yeah. I, I, again, I'm an entertainer. And also one of the things I said, I, I've been a food and wine columnist forever. And I look at us as spiritual beings in a physical body. And the way the physical body experiences the universe is through our five senses. And just like art for the eyes, music for the ears, the palate is also one of the ways that we as spiritual beings experience the universe. And that's something that I really, I lived in France for three years. Uh, and that's something that I, I really took in was the art for the palate with food and wine. That's interesting. How do you see the French experience with uh, film versus uh, the American experience? <laughs> well, I, I was in a theater company. Uh, and <laughs> uh, we had a hit show and we were in one film and the French would drink wine during lunch oh, and it would be oh. hours before they'd get the next shot off. <laughs> That's the problem, yeah. Uh, and and then there's that. like, uh, we have our kind of three-act story structure, you know, an inciting incident, da 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 then the finale. Okay, the French story structure is they don't take off their clothes and screw till the second act. Oh. <laughs> That's good. They show yeah. some reserve. They, they yeah, build up to it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there's an arc. No, no, but I appreciate the, I, I love France. My, one of my sons is half French. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean they're they're amazing. Uh, they're amazing in everything that they do. The French, yeah, obviously. Yeah. 
but I know that they have a very you know specific approaches to things and I just wondered do you think that Americans are super controlled in their approach to the artistic process or that's just a fallacy I, I don't I, I, people are different in every culture and you'll find you know left brain right brain you'll find everything in every culture sure would you say you're right brain uh, <laughs> pretty much so although I, I I've kept one foot in business at the same time. So I've got a little bit of a left brain. Right. The right brain gets it into trouble. Kind of old Steve Jobs is, is someone that I idolized. And uh, he had seemed like both in many ways. And so do, do you see that as being a blessing or is it in some ways difficult to compartmentalize the right versus the left because if one will fight with the other? Well, one, okay, so like, like, like one wants money for the project and the other <laughs> wants to pay the bills. You know, so we do have, a, you know, that... A, <laughs> sure, it's a tug of war. I, I, I don't know, like, I'm thinking of that Seinfeld episode where the Mr. Penis and Mr. Brain are arguing with each other <laughs> over who, who gets to do what. I wasn't expecting that reference. Okay, I was thinking of another one. But. Oh, and I, I have one more answer that I thought of earlier for the... Can you ask me the one about the, dealing with adversity and stuff like that? Oh, please, go ahead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I put on big parties and big events. So I've got something, I'm co-hosting it with a major Hollywood producer. We've got all these big wigs, black tie. So I'm, I'm a Afro-Latin percussionist. I play in a Brazilian uh, bateria. Uh, so I had an Afro-Brazilian group, the sweetest people you'd ever meet, voice and percussion. And people are all drunk and you know, like the, the music's going, and I've got the head of a studio with his bimbo. So as they passed my musicians, he made some denigrating remark, boy, why couldn't they get some real music? And it cut these guys. It was the biggest night of the year for them. Oh. And so I don't know if it was the two bottles of champagne or the full moon, but I picked the little fuck up and threw him in the swimming pool. There you go. And like Dracula, like you're never going to work again. I've got tuberculosis. You know, he went in the pool. He didn't like it, uh, and everyone secretly like going, oh, loving it. And then his bimbo went off like a banshee. I threw her in, and I went back to my Brazilians and apologized for his boorish behavior. Oh wow, bourgeois or boorish? Boorish. Oh, I see. Okay, I was going to say it uh, could be either. And as he said, I didn't work for a few years in Hollywood. Is that, is, that, is that a foul? I mean, is, or is it so controlled that really if you don't acquiesce to someone, and not even have a confrontation at that level, but let's suppose there's a slight, someone feels slighted, could that really ruin someone's career? Uh, I'm not sure. It's, uh, I mean, also what happened is I've always kept one foot in like real estate investment and development. And when I threw them in, I was worth so many million. And then the market crashed and I wasn't worth that much a year later. Oh, so that okay. affected things. It might have affected my decision if I knew the market was going to crash. Was this Two like bottles of champagne notwithstanding. Oh, I see. Okay. You think money gives people confidence? It helps. Mm -hmm. You know, you can hire a lawyer and get out of trouble. But not just that, not just the, the legal aspect, but in terms of how you approach things, if you feel well, that... By me having, call it like the left brain side, mm -hmm. and having at least some real estate income coming in every month, uh, if I'm modest, I don't have to work, and I can just choose projects that I, I like. Mm -hmm. So I'm not forced to take jobs that I hate. Sure, sure. Yeah, so, so yeah, sure, that helps. You know, I've, I've got a family. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, you know, there's the... the a lot of debate about that, but I would imagine that having, um, knowing that you could not have to do something that you don't want to do for a year and be okay, probably lends confidence to how you approach things and then that yeah, brings yeah, yeah, things. Yeah, 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 it does, it does. I, I, I watched my father, God, he, he'd often have two, three jobs. He eventually became a school teacher. He's supporting two families, one from before the war, one from after the war. He'd get up before dawn and deliver milk, then have tutoring things in the evenings and on weekends, had factory jobs. Uh, I've had to do a bit of that, but not to the degree that my father had to. That's interesting. 
You know, I, I was listening to the author, John Updike, speak, and he saw his father struggle as well, and he was a teacher, and, and it just, he knew that he didn't want to be a company man, and I'm not, not to use that in a derogatory term, but in terms of being sort of owned by somebody and knowing that that ownership can tell you, okay, now it's time to go, and all the problems that that causes. So did you know that you never wanted to sort of work a corporate job because of that same side of... Same sort of... Uh, I, I just, I've been blessed enough that I really haven't had to. I, I've done, I, I've been a cab driver, I've been a busboy, I've tended bar, uh, but those things were shorter term and, and voluntary while I was doing artistic stuff. Right. And, and right now I, I don't have to do stuff like that. Oh. You, you tend bar for yourself. You, for, I tend your, your, for, for, friends for friends and friends family, and family yeah. for cast and crew, <laughs> but that's my pleasure. Sure, that's, that's, sure. that's my greatest enjoyment yeah. is to, to cook and feed people. That's and nice. to entertain them. We do theatrical dinners. That sounds nice. Yeah. What's the longest you've gone in your life without creating something? Never. I write. <laughs> so, <laughs> and and uh -huh. I play with music groups. I, I'm in a band right now. So <laughs> even back, let's say you were a busboy somewhere doing something, you still had something creative you were doing. Yeah, I had a Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo that ah, became okay. the band Oingo Boingo while I was doing that stuff. Sure. Excellent band. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's never been a time when you've not been creative? Never. Uh, you... My one fallback is I love to write. Uh, I, I've been a, a food, wine, and travel columnist, I, I've been a, a film and theater reviewer, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I, I've, I've got some unpublished novels that I want to get illustrated this next year, uh, and some other screenplays too. But I, I always write. I, I love to write. Do you do it every day? No. It, it goes in binges. Are we talking about Charles Bukowski? fits of writing or are we talking about like I mean what what what'll sprung oh, oh, oh okay like if I'm doing a 2,000 word mm -hmm. journalist piece I'll write all night and into the next day get some sleep and then do a rewrite and then I'm done so it's kind of a three-day cycle the film that I just shot I wrote almost night and day for three weeks oh. and at this point uh, the son of my mother, the novelist, English teacher. Uh, even though I just did a crazy project, the story structure is very classically grounded in terms of acts, story development, pacing. That I've, I've, I've learned it. The quote, find something you love and you'll never work a day in your life. What do you think about that quote? It's kind of true. It's my work is my play. For the most part, oh, there's you know with film, then there's a, a, the whole side of it of scraping the money together and then fighting with forces that want to change it. Uh, fortunately, I've got the best producing partners I've ever had in my life right now, and, and we're going to be doing more projects together. But were there ever times when you thought, you know, I may have to do something I don't want to do, and you saw your dad work these different jobs? And I think when people have that early memory of a parent going somewhere that they didn't like to go to, I think that really sticks with them. Until I got into <clears throat> real estate development, that was true, but then it was no longer true. That I had this side thing that I could rely on. If the market wasn't good, okay, we're, we're going to get uh, $7 wine instead of $20 wine. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Well, the market's not, I mean, it's cyclical, so... I, I, I've, been, I've been through boom and bust. Sure, sure. Yeah, I, I've got formulas that protect me from oh, that. Oh, okay, okay. So, so you've learned that, okay, like, you know, as of today, who knows where we'll be in three years? Yeah, Today's one of yeah. those sort of, we're in, we're in a sort of a shaky time right now. So when you know we're coming up on that, how do you say, okay, I still want to do my creative stuff, but I have to sort of protect my backside? Well, the other way to look at it, there's a time to sell, and then there's a time to buy. And things go cyclically. Sure. And I have the special voodoo powder that I put around the properties okay. that protects them. Oh, okay. Yeah, right. yeah. And a, a dance that I, I do. I have to wear a clown suit and <laughs> under the full moon, smoke a cigar. <laughs> um, what do you have to do for your art? God, that... 
what do I have to do for my art? If, if, if you, <laughs> on your IMDb, you have a quote and you, you put, and, and it's probably from another paragraph, but you just put, you have to do these things for art. What are these things? God, I don't even know where that quote came from. And I don't own it. And I don't know who put it there or where they heard it. Uh, it just might have been some quip. It, my film Forbidden Zone became a cult hit. And uh, every couple months I go to some different city and I, I've got a screening and I put on a live show. And I'll even cook after. And, um, you know, do a Q&A. And I've said so many thousands of things at the Q&A. I don't know where that one came from. Okay. We'll, we'll have our interns. Someone said, like, you know, did out. you have to suffer to get those suits in Forbidden Zone? Like, yeah, you have to do things for art. You know, I, I don't know. We had another quote that you said that sometimes a film has legs. So is that something you can orchestrate or that's where the audience decides whether well, Okay, here, here's Forbidden. Okay, I'm a stage director and I'm a musician. And the Mystic Knights of the Oingo Boingo was changing from a 12-person Commedia dell'arte troop into the rock group Oingo Boingo. So I wanted to just preserve on film what I'd been doing on stage. So I took 12 musical numbers from the stage show and then just threw a plot together. And the film kind of came and went over summer, uh, offended a lot of people. There were arson threats at theaters. I was in a theater where there was an arson threat. New Beverly, Quentin Tarantino's theater. We had to, everyone cleared out, fire department came. Film disappeared. Uh, it's on video for a little bit. Music rights weren't cleared. It's pulled. Now it's gone for 15 years. I didn't know that it was on college campuses, went like wildfire with bootlegged things, whatever. And then when I put up my first website about 10 years ago, I get tens and thousands of hits and inquiries from all over the world from fans of this film that I thought had disappeared. So it, that's what I meant, it has legs. Right. So when you know that something is controversial, we don't have to go into the reasons why really, but when you know that all of this has happened, how do you, what, what are you doing the next day? Do you remember that when, when you found out all, you know, with the music rights, people are upset, how are you then saying, I'm gonna still continue to be here? Well, I'm kind of a damn the torpedoes kind of guy. Uh, <laughs> you know, I have a vision of what I want to do, mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm, I'm doing it. I, I mean, I just did a film. I'm very happy with it. I'm about to do another film. But have you ever had times when, I know you grew up here, so it's not like you're going to pack up and go home somewhere that's not, you, you're from L.A., but where you say, you know what, I'm going to quit all this and, you know... I don't know, start a farm somewhere, just just get out of this this crazy town, or or is that never entertained you? Never, never entered my mind. Okay. And I, I could go to Cuba and play in a Latin group and be happy. So... <laughs>
at the time that it happened? Did you feel that way or, or? Completely glad I did it. Really? Okay. Yeah. Wow. And so are you able to talk a little bit about what happened in terms of how it bankrupted you? Or I mean, just, just maybe. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I had no idea what I was doing. I didn't clear the music rights. Uh, the animation cost, although I had a very talented animator, it cost like 20 times what I thought it was going to cost. And, <laughs> you know, I was just starting in real estate and, you know, part-time jobs as a, as a busboy and a cab driver, you know, and I'm forking money in. Uh, <laughs> you, you know, it was like uh, some people go to film school, I just made a film. Have you always done it that way, sort of seat of your pants? And you just jump right in, and that's how you learn the good and the bad? Yeah, how to do something? yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Did people try to stop you? Uh, it was just economic. Oh, only economic. Yeah, I mean, it's scary. You know, that I, I, I had to shoot it in, in starts and stops as I'd get some money. I had a little bit of help from friends and some partners, mostly on my shoulders. Right. And then I'm assuming you, you took out like a second or something in order to, to fund. Yeah. The, okay. And so then. Well, more than that. And then to finally get it released, I had to sign away all control. So I'd, I only got control of the film fully back a few years ago. Oh. A long story. But I only got 100% control of Forbidden Zone a few years ago. So that, what, I'm sorry, what was the time span? 15 years? 40 years. 40 years. Oh, sorry. So, was, the film was done 40 years ago. Wow, 40 years. Okay. <laughs> sorry, it seems like 15 to me. Yeah, okay. yeah. How, how, are you thinking about it every day for the last 40 years? No, I don't think about it at all. Think about the next dinner, the next article. <laughs> What wine we're pairing? With? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh -huh. My brother's writing fantastic music that I have going through my head. I know you said music is very... Yeah, and I, I have a very, I'm blessed with a very rich family life. Sure, I'm just, I'm just hoping to get little, little nuggets that we can, you know, give to our audience because there's a lot of people that we watch our stuff that, I'm not saying they haven't been as blessed, but that they want to know how somebody gets to this level. And, and that's kind of what, what we do with Film Courage. So, Well, a, a positive attitude is important, although I don't know how you convey somebody who has a negative attitude to just tell them the words, have a positive attitude. Uh, you know, if you're going to get knocked down, you've got to get back up. Everybody gets knocked down. Everybody gets knocked down. You've just got to get back up and go back at it. Right. So you weren't really thinking about acquiring the rights back? For all this time? No. Uh, someone acquired them, made me a partner. It's a long story, and I only ended up with it recently. <laughs> How would you say the theatrical release of Forbidden Zone, the first one, changed your life? Uh, well, we were in the New Beverly Theater, now owned by Quentin Tarantino, and there was the arson threat and we had to leave. No, it, it didn't change my life. Well, other than losing my house, yeah, that changed my life. But six months later, I had a better house. You know, <laughs> with some real estate partners. Sure. Uh, it, you know, things worked out. It, you know, but again, I had to pick myself up, you know, and go at it again. Yeah, God, if I could give anyone advice, it's tenacity. It's if you're tenacious, your odds are better. The other thing I've learned is you get periodic opportunities and we don't always take advantage of them. We don't always, I, I had a chip on my shoulder with Hollywood for a long time and I was courted by agents and basically, you know, here's my card, knock on no door, suck on no door. I don't need stars, you know, I'll do it my way, whatever, you know. But it was like, uh, I, I can't even tell you a few names that reached out to me. Uh, but now I, I have a, a mellower view, you know, with, with forces in the industry. And then when I had my media company buzzing, I, I got to see a little bit how things work and how the wheels turn. So it kind of took the chip off my shoulder. Were you able to share uh, how you see things work in the industry? Uh, be aware that opportunities come up and go for it, even if you're going to fail. 
but go for the opportunities when they come up. Every one of them. Uh, your biggest regret, I've read from people at the end of their lives, was not attempting to do something. Right. Uh, I don't know how many times Walt Disney went bankrupt. Yeah, I, I know that's a, a common um, thing we hear. I mean, because I, I know an actor gets to a point where they say, I don't want to work for free anymore. I want to be treated as a professional. And that makes sense. So uh, I would imagine that's the same for directing theater or a film. Well, I just directed some theater. And uh, when you direct small theater, even if you fill the seats, you're still going to lose money. So that's, uh, although the interesting thing, um, my wife Anastasia is in a theater company, uh, Force of Nature Productions, and they put up one of my plays last year. And in the play, I wrote that there was this quirky band. So for the play, we actually put a band together for the play, and now the band is existing on its own, and they're in my new film, uh, Mambo de Monaco. <laughs> I think I saw them playing, and you were playing the, the drums too? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. So, uh, you know, but I didn't make any money from the, the theater production. You know, we filled our 90 seats, whatever. But you, you don't make money from small theater. Sure, you do it it's for, for the, the love, love of it. it. Mm -hmm. Well, you do art for the love of it. And if you make money, then that's a, a blessing as well. But you're doing it for art. And that should be its own satisfaction. What is your biggest regret with Forbidden Zone? I'm trying to think, in my article, if I did it, I, I had... Everything was ridiculed. It was a human cartoon. I probably wouldn't have had these little blackface moments in it. Just that I'd stepped on more toes than I intended. Uh, and I was raised in that community for the most part. Uh, other than that, nothing. I, I, but even then, it was uh, no harm intended. Everything was a cartoon. I, I was even accused of anti-Semitism the Jewish money changer, Mr. Bernstein, with his extreme Jewish mannerisms, was my own grandfather, and he wasn't acting. <laughs> <laughs> but I was accused of anti-Semitism. Mm. You know, you can't win and do something outrageous. Sure. Well, I think there's a past when you can make fun of your own culture, don't you think, or no? We've gotten to a point where we can't even make fun uh, of our own it, culture. It's, it's gone overboard. It's gone overboard, where people take offense where none was intended. And that's where I draw the line. You have to look at the intent. Are they intend? you know, like, uh, God, I did so many interviews in Buzzy, and I once interviewed Lisa Lampanelli, who's an insult comic. She insults everybody, including herself, and the audience is completely diverse. Black, white, Asian, Jew, Gentile, gay, straight, and she hits them all, and then hits herself worse than anybody, and everybody loves it. Sure. And to me, that's healthy. I was watching a clip with Robin Williams. Uh -huh. performed in San Francisco, he's from the Bay Area, where I'm uh -huh. from. And just the jokes and how he was able to, to make fun of himself, but as well as he would poke fun at the audience and different things, you know, different San Francisco stereotypes, which uh -huh. there are definitely many. Uh -huh. um, do, do you think that uh, comedy and, and absurdity has changed? Well, it's a little, um, <clears throat> again, artistic censorship comes in many guises. And it's always feeling self-righteous. And comedy is hurting right now. Jerry Seinfeld won't go on college campuses right now because it's too politically correct. Mm. Uh, and th that's where the pendulum's gone too far. Sure. Well, I mean, if you think back to the 60s, and, and there was a lot of political turmoil uh -huh. in that time, and then for people that were teenagers in the 80s and 90s, it, it wasn't as much so. And now we, we've come into a new th thing where young people are more political, which is great. But have we gotten... I, wouldn't say, I disagree. I okay. thought they were more political in the 60s. Okay, so you it don't think It just seems there's like that. Just seems like that. Right. Yeah, it just seems like that. Do you think they were less offended then? Uh, yes and no. I, I, it, people were offended then. They're offended now. But right now, the tiniest group that's offended kind of gets this echo chamber and a bigger effect where most people don't give a shit. You oh, know, okay. <laughs> I mean, that, that's how I see it. And, and it, it'll pass. You think it's cyclical as well? Yeah, yeah, and it'll, it'll be something else 20 years from now. 
Interesting. So just like we were talking about the real estate cycle. And the yeah, it's already because a, a lot of comedians are starting to blanch at, you know, this, this is just too much. Sure. How do you think a society becomes so sensitive to its art? Well, it's always been, you know, look at the Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> you know, there's always been, a, a, you know, the Red Guards in China destroying all the older art. Uh, you know, it, it happens, but it, it's artistic censorship. Mm -hmm. It's that's, you know, artistic censorship. It'll always be here in one form or another. And again, you think it's cyclical. Yeah, or like who they're going to hit. You know, right now, if it's coming from the left, then it'll be coming from the right again. I, it, I mean, you know, it goes both ways. Well, the author, uh, Margaret Atwood, mm -hmm. she talks about how artists have always, and writers have always been targeted first. Mm -hmm. But also, too, they're ones that can be more outspoken because most people have a day job. And mm -hmm. so they can't tweet about certain things, but it, someone who's not beholden to a certain company or a boss that's watching them on social media, which I think a lot of companies do watch people, mm -hmm. um, the artist has more freedom. So do you think that's maybe why uh, artistic types are more chastised when something happens? It's because they're, they have the ability to be more outspoken? Yeah, probably. I mean, also social media has changed things a lot. That anything anyone has ever done, someone can dig up and amplify it, or a small group can attack someone, and it's like, boy, they're being slammed on social media. Slammed by who? By 20 people, not, not by 100 million people. It, you know, but it's, uh, so, so things are, perception is off. Sure, and there's people that actively look for those, yeah, those yeah, moments. Yeah, 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 that I, I, I what, what, I'm gonna be offended. What can I be offended by? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I do outrageous humor. <laughs> <laughs> and and outrageous outrageous so somebody's going to be outraged sure well you know back like the church lady on on saturday night live yeah what was so funny about that was that you would see the little looks on dana carvey's face you know over like a smallest sexual reference or whatever and so that's what made it so funny and it was it was tame at that point uh -huh. but I, I feel like now we've crossed a new line. But then if you drive around LA and you see some of the billboards, what, what I've noticed is that when the economy is doing poorly, the billboards become more risque. I don't know if that's just in my mind I'm seeing that, but I noticed that during the last recession, all the billboards that I saw were very risque. Well, Maybe I, never, that's... I never, I didn't notice that. I'll, oh, okay. I'll have to pay attention to that. Yeah. By the way, I love Dana Carvey's church lady. Uh-huh. And I'm sure it offended somebody in Kansas. <laughs> There's some church ladies. <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> Where have you found the balance to be? You were talking about being right brain and left brain and being a business person and also a creative. Uh -huh. where, where do you find that that's come from? Because I know you said, well, you delved into commercial real estate or, or real estate, but not everybody has that ability or access to capital to do that. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised, like if you found a really, really good deal that makes economic sense, the money finds you, believe it or not. In real estate, not in film. In film, it's the opposite. Interesting. <laughs> but you it, have to it, find the money first? Yeah, yeah that like, like here's a property, here's, here's the rents, here's what it's selling in the neighborhood, da-da-da-da. Mm -hmm. We can paint it up, put in some gardening, da-da-da-da-da-da. You know, here's, here's the numbers, and it makes sense. Interesting. Whereas it's the, the reverse for a film. In, yeah, particularly to do anything original in film. So you have to it, find them. It's almost impossible. Not quite impossible, but almost impossible. So, that, that's, that's the biggest battle with independent film. Right. So it's not, hey, this is a great story. This is going to touch a lot of people. It's where do we have a group of investors that want to make this? And then you find the script first. So, so are you pooling together... A bunch of people that well it works different ways i, I mean basically <clears throat> we kind of shot this film with just it was a minuscule budget for what we were attempting and we shot it with half half of that and then it took us over the next year to scrape the rest of it together oh. right now i'm in my own pocket helping sure. to finish the film 
sure. Are you uh, crowdfunded? Pardon me? You crowdfunded? Mm -hmm. I crowdfunded Forbidden Zone 2's development. Not enough to get the film shot, but enough to get a professional budget, professional breakdown, what they call previs, you know, get all the art designs done. So I've got this package and the film that I just did, Hipsters, Gangsters, Aliens and Geeks, is helping fund the rest of Forbidden Zone 2, which I'll do next. Ah, okay, okay. And did you think about uh, crowdfunding for the Hipsters one? No, it was uh, a fabulous producer that I work with uh, from the wine world, uh, kind of like brought it to the table. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> now I understand that Vern Troyer's last role. This was, was in, his last hipsters role. Gangs. Okay. And so can you talk about how you were able to cast him in the film and, and Well he someone got him the script and he actually one of our leads is for a little person. Uh, and he wanted that role. Uh, and I admired his talent so much, but I didn't feel that he was physically strong enough uh, or emotionally strong enough, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll be honest. But anyway, he was a prince to work with when we did work together and uh, couldn't have been more professional and, and great comedian. And, and the person that I ultimately cast for the role hit it out of the park. Why are you attracted to absurdity? Huh. <laughs> I, I don't know if I can answer that. It's just like, like, why do you like chocolate? Why do you like vanilla? Uh, I like, well, first of all, life is absurd. And one of the ways we can look at life is that things can be absurd at times. And that's a big part of my art is anything written by Richard Elfman is going to be absurd. You can count on that. Was there a moment when you saw that, you know, the, the famous saying that tr truth is stranger than fiction? My brother Danny Elfman had no musical training. He had no particular musical interest growing up. No big record collection, didn't go to concerts, no guitar, whatever. And I think we got him guitar when he was 15, 16. And I don't know if you saw Sweet and Low. It was based on uh, Django Reinhardt, uh, one of the world's most famous jazz guitarists from the 30s and the 40s. A month later, Danny could pick out every note of a Django solo. Not with the tonality, but he could hit every note. And then we got him a violin, and a month later, he could do the Stepan Grappelli violin accompaniment. No training. No training at all. Like a musical savant. Yeah, yeah. And for me, with uh, Afro-Latin percussion, same thing. It just came to me. And I mean, I'd be with... <sighs> A few years later, I'm the only white guy and I've got like, I have full lips and really kinky hair. And then s someone would say like, oh, oh, he, he part Cuban or something like that just to not hurt feelings. <laughs> you know, when I stopped, no, no, the solo goes like this. <laughs> you know, and I, I didn't say anything. I just kind of, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Did one of your parents have that ability where they could just, like they were, they could adapt to things without... My father played a little bit of jazz trumpet before the war, but I wouldn't say he was a virtuoso. He just helped put himself through college like that. And uh, no, I don't know where that came from. And for me, just percussion from Danny, any instrument he'd pick up, he can play. That's really amazing. Yeah. You said your mom wrote after 50, like 16 books or something? Published 16 novels. Right. I mean, that's where, where did that aptitude come from? Did she? That surprised us. We didn't know she had it. Yeah. Just, you know, huh. just pleasant surprise. Yeah, I wonder if that's like a magical element, you know, you're talking about. I, I mean, I miss her too. She worked for me with my media company doing theater reviews and literary reviews. Mm -hmm. uh, she interviewed Salman Rushdie and all these interesting authors. But occasionally I'd have some question or problem. I'd call her in the middle of the night. Like, hey, mom, like in the second act, I've got like, you know, and she bang, you know, so I don't have that anymore. Yeah. But it sounds like then you had parents that, that picked up certain things naturally, and maybe the two of you saw that. And that well, was... she was an English teacher for 25 years mm. and read voraciously, mm. you know, which I, it's something I recommend to people. Mm. Do you have a favorite author? 
God, it sounds corny, but Mark Twain, maybe. Mm -hmm. I, I like the humor. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Bradbury. God, I... I... <laughs> Stephen King at times. Mm -hmm. uh, you know. I was listening to some interviews with William Gibson. Um, he, wrote, he was sort of the, the writer that term the coined the term uh, or they cyberpunk from some yeah of his, yeah some of his books and um, he has a great um, quote that I saw um, people had translated into numerous languages and it was before you diagnose yourself as depressed make sure that you're not surrounded by assholes. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought that was great, but. Yeah. You could you could take it down a few notches and, and 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 soften it up a bit and say well, before you say that you're creatively blocked, make sure you're around people that are encouraging your art. I don't yeah. Know. Oh, oh, F. Scott Fitzgerald, mm, okay. Raymond Chandler. Yeah. yeah. It, it, you can't really understand Los Angeles and Hollywood unless you've read Raymond Chandler. Mm -hmm. uh, no, but I, I don't. I, I surround myself with wonderful people. I, I don't have any assholes in my universe. But not even just then. I'm, I'm using that term. People that don't that end up in the swimming pool. Well, okay, right, right. <laughs> or, or, or with a, a young starlet on your arm and, and, you, and you push them in. Yeah. But <laughs> threw them in. Threw them in. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> but it was all in good fun. It was, a, no, it, was a, it was a great visual. Yeah, a couple glasses of red wine. Everybody's having steaks. If you could have seen him struggling out of the pool in a wet tuxedo, he mm -hmm. didn't like the way he looked. <laughs> Uh, okay, okay, Alpha. But, but but calm down, calm down. No, no, no. I, I like it. I like it. I like to hear the story. <laughs> I'm just wondering, not so much assholes in your life, but just people that encourage you. There can be people that aren't assholes in your life, but maybe they don't encourage you. So, if we took that quote and said, "Well, before you think that you're blocked creatively, mm -hmm. um, make sure that you have people that encourage you." Well, I'm I'm blessed with a great my wife. I work with my wife. All she actually choreographed the cabaret numbers in the film and did four different acting parts in it. You can't recognize her one to the other. Uh, she's been a huge encouragement. You know, and my, my sons, my brother Danny, his wife Bridget Fonda, I, I get amazing encouragement. You know, and my parents encouraged me. Mm. After think, they got over me dropping out of college. And you were there for a year? Was it UC Berkeley or where no, were you? No, no, no. I was. A, I, I had a high test scores, terrible grades. They took me into Cal State. I lasted a semester and a half, dropped out. And then I ended up opening clothing stores, one adjacent UC Berkeley, one adjacent UC Santa Barbara. So I didn't go to college, but I clothed those who did. And uh, when I told my parents, who were the first generation after 5,000 years of Jews to make it through college, that I'm dropping out. If I told them I was an axe murderer, I'm going to be in jail for life, but I'm taking a college correspondence course, would have been the better <laughs> news that I'm dropping out. Sure. And it wasn't until I was in a hit show in Paris two years later that uh, Peter Brook from the Royal Shakespeare Company is our executive producer. My parents come over, they meet him. Then we're at Cafe Du Majot, and James Baldwin comes to the table, big fan of the show. Then it was okay for my parents that I dropped out of college. When you opened those clothing stores, do you mind me asking what year was that? 69, 70. Okay. So politically turbulent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were the, the bank in front of one store was burned down. The constant in Berkeley, it was constant riots, you know, with police and heads getting broken in and stuff like that. Yeah, it was very politically turbulent. Sure, sure. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. It, that's okay. The clothing that you were um, selling, were you finding the designers and then they had. No, no, I, I had two partners. One of them went to shows in New York four times a year. So it was kind of like priced for students, but kind of like trendy stuff. You know, affordable and trendy, as I would describe it. The, the, the store was called the Rag Theater. We thought we'd get rich immediately and do movies. Uh, we forgot that you had to work 80 hours a week <laughs> to compete with the store up the street, let alone boarding up the windows for the riots. 
Interesting. <clears throat> was this more sort of a beatnik look? Sort of bell bottoms. No, 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 no. Okay. trendy. Trendy. Oh, trendy. okay. So yeah. that wasn't considered. Tra okay. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Hmm. And uh, what ultimately caused you to close the stores? Uh, my f call this fate. Okay, so I'm I'm working with a a largely transvestite troupe called the Cockettes, C O C K E T T E S, <laughs> in San Francisco. Uh -huh. And it's my first, you know, I'm, I'm writing, I'm directing, and although I'm an ugly drag, I'm performing with them. And uh, it was just a coincidence that some of the key politically placed members of the troupe happened to like stuff in my clothing store. So it was, uh, anyway, anyway, we won't go into the things we have to do. <laughs> and I've got some material for the show. And sure, I'll put a dress on, you, you know, but... Uh, uh, some guy like Johnny Depp could look beautiful. I, I'm ugly in drag. <laughs> Skarsgård's beautiful too. When yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah my <laughs> jaws too. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> anyway. So uh, uh, the Coquettes were supposed to go to this festival of new theater in uh, not Toronto in Toronto. Okay, festival of new theater in Toronto. Uh, but it was just too big, too unwieldy a group. To make it there. Okay, my father has a mild heart attack in northeastern Canada. Oh. I drop what I'm doing, fly to see him, he's okay, take care of it, figure out a way to, you know, I'm there for a week. They've got a car and a trailer arranged to get that back. He's okay. I stop in Toronto on the way back to see this theater festival. I run into some scruffy French troupe called the Grand Magic Circus doing some like street theater and they're going to be in the festival of new theater there was something about them a charisma a panache alan could you use a little percussion background <laughs> in the show may we oui. will you give me 3 minutes and someone to play an eric sati piece where i do this it's like a horror drag thing uh it worked out really really well i had you know rented some drums. Six months later, Peter Brook from the Royal Shakespeare Company picks them up in Paris and says, uh, I'm going to put you in an 800 seat theater and give you full backing. I get a letter from Paris. You want to join the company. And I don't know who's seen a film, uh, Children of Paradise, or in French, Les Enfants de Paradis, about mm -hmm. the French theater scene in the 1830s, the high theater and the low theater. It's like a three and a half hour film, amazingly done during World War II, but they did it. It was one of those epiphanies for me. I, I saw it, walked out of the theater, turned around, saw it again. So this was, do you want to come to Paris and be in this theater company? So I sold out of the, the stores. I, I gave my interest to my partners, went to Paris, and the show was a huge hit. It filled 800 seats for over a year. Uh, and the director, Jérôme Savary, went on to become the director of the French National Theatre. So I'm working with kind of new people and also like veterans of the Comédie Française. And nothing teaches timing than live stage. Period. Period. Uh, and, <laughs> and, you know, we worked every day. I only saw like the Eiffel Tower and the Louvre and those things years later when I went back to visit. And what happens with a hit show, um, if we had a day off, then there's a commercial, and I don't look like it, but I got modeling gigs, which I've always looked at myself as like ugly and bizarre and clown-like. So that was like a, I would call that an ego boost, where I just had to stand there and act cool. <laughs> I'm not classically handsome, but oh yeah, cool American. Uh. <laughs> So that, and I, you know, and I'd send the magazines back to my mother who'd show them to her girlfriends. And, you know, that was, uh, anyway, it, no modeling gigs recently. Let's see. <laughs> maybe if I get my teeth whitened and I've had my nose fixed twice, but maybe I'll get a smaller one the next time it's from boxing. <laughs> it seems like, though, you, you I, I see this image of your life that you've like, these, these opportunities have presented themselves. Whereas most people would say, well, that sounds really cool, but I have to stay with this. And you're like, I'm going for it. 
Is that is that accurate that you you? Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, my media empire, Buzzine, uh, I ultimately lost it, you know. And then I have a film, you know. But you know, I it, it wasn't like a, a a pleasant landing. It was like I fell off the roof, you know. Mm. But you get up, get your breath again. God, I, okay, this is when I was in this boxing stable. I, I won't say his name because he was this tough old son of a bitch. Uh, and I've worked with Rod Steiger on the waterfront with Marlon Brando doing this thing. I could have been a contender, but he sold him out for the short money. So this was one of the toughest trainers in the business. But as a manager, he would his fighters would win 10 fights, then he'd outclass them and they'd lose the next 10 for the short money. Wow. And you'd see guys with slurred speech in their mid-30s. So, uh, but he was an amazing trainer. But almost every day, at, for some imagined infraction, I'd have to hold my arms open, and he'd hit me in the solar plexus and knock all the wind out of me, where it takes like 1,000, 2,000, you know, three, to get you, your first breath back. And you realize that you can still breathe, you haven't been hurt, and you can even keep boxing in that state. Uh, did a little damage in here that, acid reflux, but uh, that, that and a, a neck, neck, neck she hairline fractures and broken hands. Mm. <laughs> they fixed the nose good though. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I almost see that you've taken opportunities in your life and, and it's almost like swinging from one vine to the next. Yeah, w- with falling down. Sure, sure. And climbing mm-hmm. up the tree again. Right, right. Yeah. Whereas yeah. most people would have been too squeamish and maybe they wouldn't have had the adventure. You definitely get knocked down and you're definitely gonna have more failures than successes. But you keep going, you keep going. Did you ever worry about playing it too safe? No. <laughs> Not Richard Elfman. It's, uh, if anything, it's, uh, you know, how far do I let myself go? Okay, so on the flip side then, have you ever been told, can you reel it back in? Yeah, and, uh, yeah, and, yeah, and how do you respond to that? I don't really reel it back in much. <laughs> oh, although I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I no longer do anything illegal. Oh no, no, absolutely, uh, yeah, not advising. <laughs> that. I'm within the, yeah, everything uh, within within the that's yeah, legal yeah, I'm, and, I'm and no one's harmed. Do, yeah, yeah. But I'm saying in terms of having fun, because you can still have fun and be wild and crazy and not hurt anybody. Yeah. Um, it, have you ever been told, hey, can you rein it in and that's just not your style and you realize that that's not for you then? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've, I've been a hired gun as a director where I have to... It, it, here's the thing with, with film. It's a collaborative medium and you have to get other opinions no matter how much of an auteur you think you are. And certain opinions will really help you. But then you get all these other people that, that don't belong there, particularly <laughs> in film, uh, giving opinions and they don't know what they're talking about. You know, so that's something you have to deal with. How do you know when to silence those and when to... How do you know who, whose voice you're going to listen to? Oh, aside you, from you, who's you, signing you, your check. You, you know, you know. I mean, also, what have they done? You know, this editor has done these 12 films that you love. My God, I don't just want his opinion, I'll pay for his opinion. Uh, this sleazy exec kind of, it, it, often in film, the, the, the biggest ability is kind of climbing the corporate ladder, not knowing how to make a film. You know, so they, to justify their existence, they're giving opinions, don't know what they're, I, I did some network television for a while and suffered with that. I, I won't get into it. Okay, that's fair. Yeah, I don't, won't get into it. You talked about that quote of people get to the end of their lives and they don't wish they'd spent more time at work kind of thing. They wish they'd taken more chances. Do you see any chances in your life that you didn't take? I know you're not done yet. You have a lot more that you want to do. But do you see certain chances that you said, you know what, back in this year, I wish I had taken that? I've taken all the chances but I've had opportunities where I've made the wrong step. Uh, After Forbidden Zone, someone who went on to become one of the biggest Hollywood producers ever 
his assistants were big fans of Forbidden Zone. They bring me in. I'm having a meeting. I've got this other script. They're kind of interested, but I don't want to cast any stars in it. It just has to be these people. And then it gets back to me, boy, he thought you were kind of stubborn. If I had a time machine, yeah, sure, I'd cast a star in it. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> you know, just call it like uh, strategic moves, that we don't always make the right strategic move. Right. But you feel good that you've taken different fun opportunities that have come your way. You've not always thought about the money. As you talked about earlier that, you know, making art is not about the money. It's about the experience of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I have a very rich life because of that. Uh, sometimes more than others financially. Uh, right now things are good. Knock wood. Good. One thing that defines you, what is it? I like to entertain. My purpose in life is to both entertain and hopefully enlighten aesthetically. That's, that's Richard Elfman. Uh, that I want to entertain and I want to enrich people aesthetically in my own way, it, to show them a, a different way of looking at things. So whether it's on stage, on film, at the dinner table. Yeah, my greatest dinners have surprise and change of location. Oh. Yeah. So you and have total dessert? surprise. Yeah. It's immersive. Immersive. Can you give me an example? Like, will you have dessert somewhere else or what, what happens? That sounds fun. Oh, you, you have 40 people over, black tie, and then you've got a tiny bungalow, and you've got so people are on the bed, on a dresser, in the bathroom, and but you've got chefs from the top restaurants uh, outside, like shucking oysters and making hors d'oeuvres, expensive champagne, and they're not sure how to deal with it. Uh, then you pass out paper plates. <laughs> and you lock the door and play really sad Jewish music for a little bit. And then suddenly someone comes in with a top hat, speaking Italian. They have to crawl through a passage. Here's a place next door where, sh okay, I have a table. It's like an oblong for 40, like 18 in the middle, 22 around it. And you have to, you don't want, anyway, you hoist the people down into the middle of the table. Okay, so that's like, a, a, I'm doing, um, I used to do these big events for the American Society of Food and Wine. The quid pro quo is I'd have top chefs do stuff for me. I'd produce events, okay. So then after that course, then they're taken on to a double-decker bus. I've got a band on top, taken up into the hills for more stuff. Uh, those are the kind of parties where I throw a studio head into a swimming pool. But uh, <laughs> surprise. So it, it's its own theater. You, you're, I look at life as theater. I look at life as theater. That more than anything kept me in boxing was being in this other universe that I wouldn't normally be in. Uh, in, in it was just like, here's this other universe and they've accepted me in this universe. Uh, even with all the, the, the bad stuff going on, and, and I mean, and boxing's so corrupt and, and so hard, mm -hmm. you know, on some of the younger fighters and stuff like that. So you said some of the coaches would almost throw the game and they would try to match them with someone that was... No, it, it wasn't throwing the game, but it was uh, where you should have taken the fighter up slower with people of comparable ability but having him outmatched just for some quick money, mm. even though the guy's gonna get killed. Yeah. You know, where you're not watching out for the fighter, it's just like, you know, paycheck, paycheck, then we'll just get more fighters. Mm. Uh, although, you know, he, he, he would teach us how to put your back between, to block the ref's view and hit someone with your elbow and, and how to, to get places here without the ref seeing. You know, he, he taught all that stuff. Have you ever thought about writing that story? Uh, <laughs> I have a lot of stories to write. <laughs> How do you select music for your films? Documentary or features? Okay, I have a certain standard. I have a thing called memorable music and uh, 
serviceable music. Serviceable music works for the production. Chicago's a great example. Loved the play, loved the film. By the time you get to your car, you forget all the music, except maybe all that jazz or something like that, because it's serviceable music, it's not memorable. It services the production. Memorable music, you take it for life. Forbidden Zone, the cinematography can't be compared to Chicago, but we have better music. And it's still, I look for things, both classics that people no longer hear or original things that my brother does that are memorable. And that's why Forbidden Zone has legs, is the music is as good today as it was 40 years ago. It, it, time just burnishes it. A, a good example of that is, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? And those were memorable music pieces that were buried in plain sight. And it, it took, I think it was T-Bone Burnett, who works for the uh, Coen Brothers, you know, to resurrect these tunes. Yeah, the, the radio station K-Rock, when, uh -huh. did, when did you first get involved with them years ago? Well, they, they were huge fans of the early Oingo Boingo and, and very supportive throughout the 80s. And by the way, uh, Hipsters, Gangsters, Aliens and Geeks is going to be filled with memorable music, I guarantee you. We've licensed, uh, it, it has a Latin, it's a Danny Elfman flavor in outer space and kind of a Latin hipster flavor on Earth. And uh, we've got some amazing cumbias from Colombia from the 50s, as well as original Danny Elfman music. When I look back at some of the Danny Elfman videos, did you help direct any of those? Yeah, I've produced some directed one, Private Life, although it was Danny's conception. He knows very much what he wants in the videos. Yeah, they're very creative, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, do you see a correlation, or do you, not, not a correlation, but do you see the difference in, let's say, music videos from the 80s and 90s compared to now, in terms of there's production value wasn't there maybe as much, but the story was there? Well, a story is very important in a musical number or a video. Uh, great uh, videos have a beginning, middle, and end, so do great musical numbers. Going back to Chicago, which had great serviceable music, but it had brilliantly choreographed dance numbers that had a beginning, middle, and end. Uh, extraordinary, extraordinary. Okay, Moulin Rouge, unfortunately, what they did is they shot the tons of footage for the musical numbers, and then just shot, 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 shot. No beginning, middle, and end. You're bored by the end of the musical number. No story. Interesting. Just a bunch of images. What did you uh, think of Birdman? I, I liked it, and I'm a huge Michael Keaton fan. Mm -hmm. uh, he was still my, well, I loved him as Batman. Loved him as Batman. And I want to see him come back for Beetlejuice. They're talking about doing oh, a, oh, another nice. Beetlejuice. Nice. He was great in The Founder, too. I don't know if you saw that. I haven't seen it. Okay, about um, Ray Kroc, McDonald's. Founder was good. Didn't see that. Mm. But when you look at Birdman, um, is there anything about his character that strikes you? Well, it was a very different, he's one of those actors that can just do anything. Uh, you know, it was just uh, an iconic role mm -hmm. and not like anything he's done. But in terms of because you've been a film director, a theater director, was there something that got you about the film just because it's not necessarily the most happy of endings, but... <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> but without any spoilers, but, but was there a part of it that you could really resonate with or? I, I enjoyed the film, but it, it wasn't earth shaking for me. Mm, okay. It just, but you know, but I, I, I love the film. Sure. Okay. Uh, I mean, I have other films that are, you know, my top 10, my top 20. Oh, your top 10. What are they? I'd love to hear them. God, in a nutshell. Okay. Hitchcock, Psycho. Uh, Scorsese, Casino, what's, what's the one with Raging Bull, uh, Coen Brothers, Oh Brother Where Art Thou, David Lynch, Blue mm -hmm. Velvet, mm -hmm. uh, Coppola, Godfather 1 and 2, 
uh, you know, <laughs> the classics. You know, with uh, Hitchcock, I was watching a documentary and they were talking about how some of his sort of sexual repression mm -hmm. was able to show. Um, <laughs> it sure did in Psycho. My God. <laughs> right. And yeah, so yeah. It, 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 what could be a hindrance to some people actually on screen and who knows what some of the stories were on set, but that it that it really translated into amazing performances and just wanted to hear your take on it since you seem uh, very open. In, in, I, I, I wouldn't describe <laughs> myself as repressed. Okay, right. <laughs> uh, you, you know, and that's the thing is like, like how crazy or neurotic does an artist have to be and how does it translate through the work? Uh, I don't believe you really have to be crazy or neurotic as an artist. Uh, you, you could learn it in some method acting classes. I, I, I've learned tricks to make actors cry. Sure. I mean, he talked. They talked about how he didn't feel comfortable in his own body, and maybe that he even used his weight as a way to kind of keep keep people away from him, you know. But that there was something about that that then translated on screen because well, he was, I, I can relate to that. I, I need to lose ten pounds if I'm going to get into this senior boxing division next year. Oh, I, I wasn't. No, I'm joking. Okay, I'm joking. yeah, no, I, I don't. I don't think you need to lose weight, but I wasn't going there. I'm just talking about you mentioned Hitchcock at the top of your list. Me, 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 and I just wasn't sure. No, he, he was a master. I, I, I and uh, I, I don't. It's hard to get into someone's head, you know. And how to me that was the ultimate explosion of sexual repression. It was it was just like a perfect film. Sure. Oh, the Third Man is one of the top of my lists. Yeah, that I can watch it over and over and over. Do you think there's there's people like Orson Welles still in this town today? Sort of this charismatic, um, I mean, there's so many charismatic people today. Oh, but oh, here, here's going to get me into trouble. <clears throat> uh, Citizen Kane, to me, is the most overrated film of all time. Okay. Uh, brilliant cinematography. Uh, Forgot the guy's name, but he actually shared his director credit with the cinematographer. Uh, God, what the hell was his name? Uh, Not Ilya Kazan. No, no, he, he did a... Uh, oh, Ilya Kazan, yeah, Ilya Kazan's one of my other favorite directors. Oh. Uh -huh. uh, anyway, but getting back to Citizen Kane, okay. So he takes this brilliant cinematographer, gives him free reign, and does innovative shots, innovative editing and has a really really interesting film but I have a simple test with film being great or comedy being funny the film being great is how easy is it for you to turn it off it is that simple no rocket science we've all got films that we don't want to turn off we're late for the appointment we want to keep watching those are our greatest films I've never had trouble turning off Citizen Kane I can't turn off Godfather 1 or 2. Uh, I, I can't turn off Scorsese's greatest films. I just want to keep watching. Uh, but just, it, it just, I don't know about you guys, but it, it just doesn't hold me. God, I love this shot. I love the editing. It's so innovative. There's genius going on, but I have no trouble turning it off. Sure. So it's not on my top 10 or top 20. How did you feel about Taxi Driver? Oh, uh, top 20. Okay. Sorry, forgot about that. Oh, no, that's okay. Yeah, Raging Bull Taxi Driver, my God, so brilliant. So brilliant. What about, I'm um, oh, sorry, I wanted to say. I mean, I have modern films. I, you know, I liked, uh, liked Wonder Woman, liked Black Panther, uh, you know, Tim Burton, Beetlejuice, Edward Scissorhands. Oh, yeah. Good. Incredible. And some of my brother's greatest work has been for Tim Burton. Yeah, so these are all on my list. What do you think the difference is between film directors, say, the, in the age of Hitchcock, maybe Scorsese, um, Coppola, you know, so we're, we're spanning a few, a few decades there, but compared to now, what's the difference? Is it just the, the rules that they have to play by? In terms of, there, there's such I mean, pressure. I mean, there's every generation has brilliant filmmakers and, and a lot of junk, you know, that time sorts it out. That's true. Time sorts it out.
because we're not really hearing about the ones that fell by the wayside back then, even though it was. Oh yeah, there were less to, filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We remember Ilya Kazan's on the waterfront, whatever, or uh, and what was a streetcar named Desire. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we don't think of the, you know we think of those, but we don't think of all the junk that happened in the nineteen fifties. What are your proudest accomplishments? My two sons, Bodie Elfman and Louis Elfman. My daughter, Audrey Elfman. Uh, <laughs> uh, a lot of stage productions and events that aren't recorded. Uh, Forbidden Zone and uh, about to come out hipsters, gangsters, aliens, and geeks. And at least the script I've got for Forbidden Zone 2 and the music that's being written for it. You said something interesting. You said a bunch of events and stage productions that have not been recorded. Yeah. So how do you think we operate now as a society? Because if like, we see something amazing, first thing we have to do is film it mm -hmm. with our phone. And it takes us out of the moment. Well, there's something, I mean, the difference between stage and theater. There's something about stage that's incomparable. That biofeedback, the audience right there. But what happened for Bin Zone was really just my stage show that I wanted to capture on film. Uh, not the same. The, the, it's something that happens with theater that's incomparable. But the nice thing about film, you get hit by a truck and someone could see it 100 years later. But the thing so, about, mm -hmm. as the truck right. barrels down, at least they'll see my films. Right. But the thing about theater is there's the chance that something could go wrong. And I think that anticipation, and we want to know how are the actors going to handle that. Shows get to a certain point that, they, that you just meld with it. You just meld with it. Uh, it, it. It's hard to describe, but something someone can forget a line and the other guy just picks up. Audience never knows, you know, like after you've played a month. Um, in our French troupe, well, Jerome Savare, he's, he was my mentor, he passed away a few years ago, drank a bit. So right in the middle, here's 800 people. And I, I got my brother into the troupe to play violin. The, our, our violinist was originally from the French opera, couldn't deviate from the score. And we'd like to do a little bit of improv with the music. So Danny got the role for a summer. So. Uh, uh, right in the middle of a scene, and Jerome was in it, he just runs out. And the actors are standing there, and here's 800 people. What are we going to do? So I just go over with Danny, and we improvised for five, seven minutes. And the audience is chanting, and he's on his electric violin, I'm on my timbales. Apparently Jerome had had too much to drink, got sick, came back, picked up the play. I've seen people fall down and break ribs and fingers, finish the scene, and then go off stage and collapse. Oh, wow. <laughs> Just like I went two rounds with a broken thumb. <laughs> you do what you have to do. <laughs> do you operate from intuition, mostly? To a large degree. To a large degree. But uh, I always like other opinions before I have a finished product. You know, like with the film, I, I, I've got to have input. You know, I test things, want to know what the editor thinks, want to know what the cinematographer thinks. Uh, you know, so it, it's not like a complete blinders. Sure. Does that sometimes get you in trouble because you know something's going to be a certain way and other people go, no, and then it turns out you were right. Yeah. And they go, wait, how did he know that? Yeah, well, it's also because a, a film, you can't really judge it until it's completely complete. And people force you to see rough, show rough cuts or this or that. And there's no way to get them to see it until it's done. But sometimes you're forced to let them see it in order to get it done. The irony. Right. Has your intuition always been strong? Yeah. Even when you were a kid? I go with the gut. Mm -hmm. Does that make people mad sometimes because you're right? And they, they get offended? They get upset? No, if it's a winner, then they all want to sign on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's true. Okay. And, and take as much credit as they can. <laughs> what about with boxing? How did you use your intuition with boxing? 
I don't think I used, I was like this, I was generally the only white guy in the gym. I hit like a mule and I wasn't the most finesseful boxer, so I don't know if it was intuition. It was more like just, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I wasn't uh, Floyd Mayweather. <laughs> uh, but you're obviously still here, so something worked. Yeah, I, I, <laughs> I have a little bit of a hard time making U-turns because of the stress fractures in the neck. Uh, but no, I, 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 I'm in good shape. I'm in good shape. You still want a box? No. No. <laughs> You still want to throw somebody in a pool? Occasionally. <laughs> Although I don't do that anymore. Okay. I, I'm more behaved. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I know the real estate market can drop. Sure, sure. But it'll come back yeah, it in LA. Back. It always comes back. Yeah. Last question is, if you could hold a dinner party for 10 deceased people and have them come back, like say you do a seance or something they would manifest, who would they be? Duke Ellington, Cab Calloway, Celia Cruz, Alfred Hitchcock, Oscar Wilde. Uh, God, how many are we? Oh, five. God. Uh, <laughs> Mark Twain. Uh, oh, God, my parents. I'll start crying. Okay, all right. So then, then, we're, then we have two more after that. Start crying. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, God, who passed? Oh, big directors. Uh, Charlie Chaplin and Stan Laurel, who produced all of Laurel and Hardy. What would you serve? Oh, maybe what I served last night. Uh, I got local Branzino, slathered it with a spicy cilantro chili, grilled it with, on, with a fennel, it's very good with fennel, and got a, an exquisite Viognier, a little bit above my price range, but the bouquet is perfect. So that's what I had for the first course. For the second course, I just got simple prime New York steak crushed a ton of fresh garlic, cooked it perfectly, put the garlic and the butter to drizzle over it. And then I grilled onions, portobellos, red and yellow peppers, uh, Anaheim peppers. And so they had fresh vegetables. And we had that with, I, I had people from Barcelona, so we had a Prioriate uh, red wine from Catalonia, excellent. And then we had vintage port with a cheese course. So that's what I served last night. That, that, that might do. And what would be the topic of conversation at this dinner? Oh, it'd be all kinds of topics. How would you start it off? I wouldn't even need to start it off. They'd start <laughs> themselves. I've got to say the greatest dinner parties are often loud. Because uh, people are talking. People are talking. They're communicating. And the, the room was only lit by fire and candles. And then we finished upstairs. I have a fireplace on the deck for the cognac and cigars. And we have cigars of all different types, by the way. My wife had never had a smoke, a puff of smoke in her life. Uh, and although I had permission to smoke cigars, it was like shower twice if I wanted to kiss in bed afterwards. But I finally found something that was so deliciously perfumed and aromatic that she'll have one now. And it's a, oh. now a couple activity nice. that we do. And she loves the way it looks with her fingernails and a cigar and, you know, kind of like breaking the mold of oh, sure. girliness. Right. Yeah. Right. It is very dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a no cell phone rule when you have these dinner parties or that doesn't matter? No one uses their cell phone. No. People take pictures sometimes. Oh, I see. That's a new sort of... No, 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 no rules. Conversation of etiquette like... Well, I do have rules. Sometimes they have to wear hats. Oh, I saw the fez out there. Yeah, and, yeah. and keep your shoes on. Okay. <laughs> a any absolute no-nos? Anything goes? Uh, no, no, no. No, I, I, I like fun. 
fun parties where people get to relax and be themselves. I do a director's night once a month. What is that? I have film directors over, get drunk, smoke cigars. Got some hot lady directors now too, oh, which nice. is exciting okay. in the horror community. We've got some uh, very interesting what's happening now. So are you talking about film when you have these directors around or, or is it completely not about film? Life, life. and mm -hmm. some film. Sure. You know, people compare notes, some horror stories, mostly just life, what's going on. And you do this once a month with these directors? Yeah, I probably have dinners, dinner parties at least twice a month. Mm -hmm. Directors thing once a month. Interesting. <laughs> that sounds fun. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sounds nice.